Welcome back to Close Up. It's not often we get to do exit interviews with primary candidates because usually when they go back home, that means they're too far away to join us in studio. But a certain Iraq war veteran and Massachusetts congressman just so happens to live right over the state line. And he's here to debrief and give some perspective on the field in the race now that he's no longer in it. Congressman Seth Moulton, thanks for joining us. It's good to be here. So it can be tough to pound that campaign trail and not see the needle move much at all. Uh, but it's still early. So why did you decide to get out of this race now? It is very early, and, and I don't think it's a good thing that essentially it's become a three-way race. But if you look at the polling right now, that's what it is. It's basically Biden, Warren, and Sanders, and there's no one else, you know, breaking out of even, even breaking out a single digit. So I always told my, my friends and supporters, my, my donors and volunteers, that if I ever got to a point in this process where I just didn't see a path to the nomination, I wasn't going to drag things out. I got in this race because I don't think there's a better foil to Donald Trump than a young combat veteran. I was the only combat veteran in the race, and I think Trump is going to be harder to beat than many Democrats like to think. But once I realized I wasn't going to be the nominee, I decided to get out. I'm excited to be running for Congress in Massachusetts again, and I'm excited to do whatever I can to support the eventual nominee. You mentioned that three-way race of Biden, Sanders, and Warren. Why don't you see that changing, potentially? you think that's going to hold all the way until February? Look, I'm not a political pundit, but the way that the DNC has set up this process with excluding people from the debates, it, it, it's just had this effect. I mean, who would have thought that getting in at the end of April, as I did, would essentially be too late? You know, if you ask what's the big mistake I made in this, that's the number one mistake is I just got in too late. And yet at the end of April, you know, almost a year before the first voters go to the caucuses and the polls, it uh, seems a bit ridiculous to be too early. And the DNC has set up a system that's repeatedly excluded the only governor of a state that Trump won and the only combat veteran from the debate stage. I, I don't think that's a smart way to pick the best nominee to take on Trump. But I'm not going to sit here and complain about it being unfair. It is what it is. It's just gotten us to where we are today in the race. Do you think that there are Democratic voters out there who are just so fearful of a second Trump term that they're looking at candidates like Biden and Sanders as known quantities? They say, we know these guys, we're comfortable with these names. Let's move forward in that direction. I think that's it. I think that's a big part of it. I also think, though, that your point about it being early is true. And, you know, a lot of people aren't paying attention at this point. But again, the problem the DNC has set up is that it's excluding people so early in the process that it just doesn't seem like there's a path for, for candidates like me who are resonating really well on the ground with people but just don't have the crowds at this stage of the race to really take off. So do you see, I mean, obviously under these rules, if this kind of holds, does it turn into like a Game of Thrones situation at the convention? Are you going to be going there and there's going to be kind of a free-for-all as to who gets the nomination? I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a little bit too early to, too early to tell, but, uh, you know, it does seem like like this has taken power away from the people. I mean, you've got Tom Steyer, who's literally bought his way onto the debate stage uh, by spending about $10 million in Facebook ads. You know, sort well, of he's not there yet, right? He's not uh, going to be on this debate stage. Well, he's probably going to be on the, the next, next one, one though. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's sort of a transfer of wealth from one Silicon Valley billionaire to another. Uh, that doesn't represent the DNC's idea of getting, of measuring grassroots support. And, you know, when you have this polling criteria, I mean, we met the criteria for the second debate, and I think nine or 12 different polls, for whatever reason, the DNC just didn't count those polls. You know, it, it, whatever. I mean, it's a, it's a little bit of a crazy system, um, but it is what it is. And, you know, what matters to me is that when I went around to towns in New Hampshire, especially in places like up in Coas County, where a lot of Democrats don't bother to go, my message was really resonating with voters. And that was encouraging. It meant that people wanted to hear about things like national security, uh, mental health, national service, three places where uh, I was leaning in heavily, had the most aggressive plans of anyone in the primary. They wanted to hear the perspective of someone who actually gets single payer health care as we're having this big debate in the party about how to deliver health care to everybody in America. So I was proud to offer those contributions to the race. And I'm glad that I elevated issues that other candidates were not and are not talking about. I'm going to continue working on that now. In fact, just this past week, we've been celebrating uh, the introduction of a bipartisan bill that I co-authored called uh, to get 988 to be a mental health hotline for the entire country. This was one of the planks of my mental health proposal, which was the most aggressive mental health proposal of any presidential candidate in history. I'm going to make sure that it gets implemented now as a member of Congress. You were very open about your own mental health struggles with PTSD, perhaps more open than any other presidential candidate has been. Certainly as a combat veteran, no surprise that you've had to deal with those things, what we know now about mental health. But uh, 
do you think, though, that um, remember early in this campaign, you had said, look, I'm not going to tell war stories. I'm not going to trade on my experience uh, in war in Iraq. What changed your opinion about opening up a little bit more, at least on the mental health front? Well, on the mental health front, I just decided that if I'm, a t uh, I'm applying for the top leadership position in, in the country, I mean, arguably in the world, then I ought to lead by example. I mean, that's a great principle of Marine Corps leadership. And as much as I'd been an advocate for mental health care, especially for veterans in Congress, I'd never shared my own story. And so I just decided that the time was right. Now, to be honest, Adam, I had not shared my story until this race because I was afraid of the consequences, because, because there's a stigma against mental health. And in fact, talking about mental health has derailed a lot of political candidates in the past. Now, it's true, we've had a lot of presidents who've been quite successful despite having some of these same challenges. Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses Grant both suffered from depression. Uh, most people think that, that Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, H.W. Bush all had post-traumatic stress, as I discussed. Uh, but it's never, there's never before in history been a presidential candidate who's talked about this. And, you know, frankly, I thought it might be the last day of my campaign when I did. But instead, I guess we've turned a corner because the response has been incredible. Uh, Vietnam veterans coming up to me and saying, you know, I haven't talked about this for 50 years, but I'm going to tell my story now. Uh, Non-veterans who've gone through traumatic experiences coming up to me and saying, Seth, you know, thank you for sharing your story because now it's given me the courage to go get help. And I didn't just share my story. I put forward an incredibly aggressive mental health care proposal for the entire country to make it routine for everybody in the military to get an annual mental health screening just like you get an annual physical. So there's nothing to be ashamed of. Just like you're not ashamed to tell your coworker, oh, I gotta go get my physical today. Um, to, to second, to extend that to every high schooler in the country where there's such a rise of mental health issues between social media and, and you know the fear of, of gun violence. Uh, mental health cases in high school are on the rise and we want high schoolers to say an example for the country as well. And then third, to have this three-digit uh, mental health hotline where anyone in the country you know, can wake up in the middle of the night and just like when you wake up in the middle of the night and you have to call the fire department, you dial 911, well, if you've got an anxiety attack, if you're thinking about suicide, you'll just know by heart 988 is the number to call. You don't have to look it up in a phone book. You don't have to worry about a different number for veterans or non-veterans. Everyone will know they can dial 988 to get help. There might be nothing that I've done in politics to date that will save more lives than this, and I'm proud that it was a part of this campaign. On the health care front, do you believe it will be more difficult for a Medicare for All candidate to defeat Donald Trump, who's already making the attack on Democrats on socialism? Yes. Yes, I do. Uh, and that's just from what I've heard from, from people out there. You know, I say that as the only candidate in this race, or, or previously in this race, I should say, who actually gets single-payer health care because I made a commitment to continue going to the VA, even as a member of Congress. And my VA experience has been rocky. Some of it's been very good. Like, for example, the VA actually negotiates prescription drug prices, which Medicare does not. So we get better prescription prices at the VA than you do through Medicare. But on the other hand, I, I got surgery shortly after I was elected, and to make a long story short, they sent me home with the wrong medications. Now, in my case, it just made for a painful night because I needed strong, stronger painkillers than, than the pharmacy distributed. They prescribed me stronger ones, but the pharmacy gave me the wrong meds. But imagine if the pharmacy had given me something that was too strong or more addictive than what I had been prescribed. I mean, I might, even, might not even be here today. We've heard the stories of veterans dying on, on waiting lists or, or literally committing suicide in the VA waiting rooms because they can't see mental health care professionals. So we got a lot of work to do at the VA, and that's not the kind of system that I want to force on everybody in America. A lot of Americans have worked hard through their unions, through their jobs to get private health care plans that they really like. I'm with President Obama. I think that we should strengthen Obamacare by introducing a robust public option that will compete against these private health care plans. And just like FedEx and UPS compete against the United States Postal Service to deliver packages and bring down prices for everyone through that competition, I think that same competition in health care will be good for the industry, it will be good for, for bringing down prices and improving quality for everybody. And you know what, if the end result is that some of these private plans are put out of business because the public plan is simply a better option, then so be it. 
but let's get there through the great regulated market approach of the American economy that served us so well in so many other places. I, I don't think if I came in as the next president and said, you know, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of FedEx and UPS. I mean, how many people think that that would actually improve service at the United States Postal Service? Well, if we have choices in America for delivering packages, we ought to have choices for delivering something much more important, which is health care. So look, every Democrat agrees that health care is a right, that everybody in America deserves access to health care. But we do have this important debate how to, about how to get there, and I worry that some of the Medicare for All candidates are just out of touch with the experience of Americans on the ground, with the experience of people like me who get health care at the VA. As we wrap up here, you're no longer in this race, but uh, you could be, a, for the right candidate, a good VP pick. Are you open to that? Well, I mean, that would be a, a, a hard decision to think about because uh, I'm very proud to be running for Congress in Massachusetts. But I will always do whatever I can to serve the country best. That's why I got in this race. That's why I'm proud of the campaign that we ran and the issues that we elevated. Um, and it's also why I'm proud to be running for Congress again in Massachusetts. All right. Congressman Moulton, we thank you for your time. Thanks very much, Adam. All right.